I did a case um, a couple of years ago where an individual was married and the w wife was accused of having an affair and he came, the husband comes home and the boyfriend is in the basement uh, <gasps> with a hat, hatchet and chops him 27 times. Oh my gosh. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another great episode of Cases Gone Wild. I'm attorney John Marco, and I got a great show for you today. As you know, on this show, we talk about the craziest, wildest, most unbelievable cases that you won't believe. But these are real cases. We're not making this stuff up, although sometimes people think it should be in a movie or a TV show because they're that crazy. Each show, I bring on amazing prestigious attorneys from around the state of Michigan and around the country to share and talk about their crazy cases. If you like us, please subscribe, share with your friends, give us feedback, tell us what you think. Don't forget we're available on all your major platforms and you can watch us on YouTube live because we got video cameras here, ladies. We dress up for you, ladies and gentlemen. On today's episode, we have a great friend, a great lawyer, well-known lawyer from Lansing who's been spent most of his career in Lansing, right, Andrew? Yes, sir. Andrew Abood. Now, Andrew, uh, I'll give a brief bio from Andrew. Andrew's dad was an attorney, a criminal attorney, and he grew up in the Lansing area, went to Michigan State University, ended up graduating from Cooley Law School, worked for your dad for a little bit, right? Yes. And then a clerk like me, we kind of have a similar career path, for uh, Justice Kavanaugh on the Michigan Supreme Court, which was a great experience, I'm sure. I, I clerked for Justice Marilyn Kelly, who was uh, on the same court at, at the same time. Uh, and then you left and you start and you went back to work for your dad before you started your own law firm, right? For five years, I, I, clerk, I worked for him and tried cases, and then I, I decided to go out on my own and. October 5th, 1997. You remember that date. So how was your dad with like, you know, like, look, I got a son. Like my dream would be for my son to come work for me. How'd your dad take it when you're like, hey, dad, I'm going to go start my own firm and, you know, do my own thing. Well, the, uh, the thing about it is, is that I was I was one of 10 kids and seven of us became lawyers. And at one time, wow. all of us, all seven lawyers we're working for him. So I was sort of like a one off. And when you have like one or two kids, you know, each one is a big deal. But when there's 10 of us, you know, one walking out on his own was not that big a deal. And he's, he definitely supported it. He knew I wasn't going far. I still remained in his building and we still worked on cases together. And I just wanted to do my own thing. I had a pretty, pretty uh, heavy practice when I walked out and all my clients came with me. And so he was supportive and uh, he he followed in my footsteps a year later when he came and joined my firm. So he must have been doing something right if all seven of the kids wanted to become lawyers. Like, was, was he pushing you guys to go into the law? He, how he never really pushed it, but he al always talked about what a great profession it was and and you know what what you could do as a lawyer and and the education itself no matter what you did you'll never regret getting the education and going to law school and then you know he had this thing which was he paid for all of our all of our co college and, and oh, law wow. school so it became a pretty lucrative deal yeah i mean i remember walking into his office during the semesters and at one time when i was at cooley five of us were at Cooley and we would walk in and he would get his checkbook out and we would tell him how much it was and he, he'd get all excited and he would write the five checks out of the account and it was you know it was a heavy burden but you know he knew what it meant to be a lawyer so how is that like working for your dad was there other lawyers at the office like or was it just him or how did that go he, he had long time partners um he had uh um other people that he had worked with that are cons we would consider great lawyers he considered great lawyers and back then we had the second page and the yellow pages 
So our phone rang off the hook. It was it was Sam Bernstein and then us. Yeah. And we were one of the few law firms that advertised. And we did personal injury and criminal defense and divorce. And so we got, you know, I don't want to say every call. Obviously, Sam got a lot. But we got a significant number of calls. And we, we could pick our cases. It was different, you know, years later. But that was what I considered sort of the romantic era of the practice of law. Yeah, and for a lot of our viewers who don't know, I mean, we take attorney advertising for granted. Like, you know, I I drive to Detroit to work every day, and I pass probably 20 billboards with different lawyers. We see them. I, you can't watch the evening news without seeing advertisements all the time. But it didn't used to be like that. Back in the day... Uh, the Michigan State Bar said you are not allowed to advertise. In fact, most states' bars uh, said that governed lawyers said if it is unethical for you to advertise publicly because it demeans the profession. Then there was a United States Supreme Court case that came out that said you as a lawyer have a right to advertise its freedom of speech. And it said it's unconstitutional for these state bars to infringe or prevent lawyers from advertising and sam bernstein was one of the first people in michigan to take advantage of that and uh went gangbusters on advertising and, and back then i heard the yellow pages was where it was at the like yellow. if you were in the yellow pages that's where people went and for for those listeners who are young yellow pages was a phone book that you got delivered right. to your house <clears throat> that's right everybody had one everybody and we were we had a full page the number two spot and, you know, to, to my dad's foresight, he realized that if nobody was advertising and you were just doing a little bit of advertising, although the full page was not a little, but you could get a significant number of calls and that his phone number and his marketing, you know, we, you, we got a lot of calls. We would get 500 new calls a month, Wow, 20, 20 a day. I remember at one time I was doing them. I was taking the malpractice calls and you'd get 10 or 15 pink slips every day that you had to return all these calls. Now those are tough to sift through as you know, because, yeah. but we would get a lot of calls and, and you know, that was sort of the way the, the practice was. And, and quite frankly, there was a lot less lawyers back then and, yeah. and you didn't really need necessarily to advertise. Right. You know, it wasn't necessarily the thing to do. And, and the other part of it is you had certain people that everybody knew that were just pillars, pillars in the community. So fortunately, my dad was one of those people. So not only did he have a great reputation along with a few other lawyers in the community, but he was smart enough to realize that, you know, if Sam Bernstein was going to do it, we weren't going to take a second seat to him. Yeah, well, that's good. And people don't understand the practice of law and the business of law, right? So like I had no business background when I went into law, when I started my own firm, I have no business acumen whatsoever, but getting clients is part of being able to have a successful practice, especially on our side, you know, like I don't have like one flagship client, like Ford Motor Company that just keeps sending me work all the time. My clients are usually people who they've had something horrible happen to them. It's a one-time event. Hopefully, you know, like right. a car crash right. or something. I represent them. They thank me. And then, you know, we hope that they don't need to call me again because it's bad stuff. But, you know, it takes a lot to uh, go through all these calls. I mean, it's a it's a major process. And you can't, unfortunately, you can't help every single person just because of sheer volume and, and whatnot. Right. But it's competitive out and, there. And the other aspect about your client that I think you would find to be true is that they probably never had to hire a lawyer before. Right. And that, and that's the significance of advertising is I tell this to people who sell us advertising all the time. I don't need to advertise to the corporations and to the insurance companies and to the business people. They, they know lawyers, they have lawyers, they know who I am. I'm out there looking for the person who's getting a divorce, who's, who was in a car accident, whose son or daughter or themselves are being investigated or charged, who's never had to hire a lawyer before. Right. This is a significant event in their life. It can be life-changing, and we want to be their top of mind because, you know, there are a lot of good lawyers out there, 
And there are some lawyers out there that um, can appear to be good. But they're not good. But they're not. There's a lot not of a bad good, lawyers out and, there. And it's very difficult to tell. It is. It is. It's like, you know, go, like I feel like it when I go to the doctor, it's like, well, somebody told me to go to this guy and I think he's good or and he looks right. good. But, you know, you don't really know until you get behind the scenes. You know what I mean? And, and right. really get to know someone. But your guys' advertising is really good. I see it all over. I was at uh, Ford Field. There, there was some event there that it had a boot. I know you guys, every time I watch the Michigan State basketball yeah. team, I see uh, a boot on the side of the court. I mean, you guys have so, a very strong Lansing presence. And so, do you do uh, cases all over the place? We do cases all over the state. Uh, obviously, we have an office in Birmingham that you've interviewed, Jeffrey yeah. Lance Abood, and he's got he's a great lawyer. He does a great job. But, you know, we've been around a long time. We I've got cases right now in Grand Rapids and, and Charlevoix and – and in Detroit and so in Ann Arbor. So, you know, as you practice, been doing this 34 years, you have people all over the state. And fortunately, you get a reputation that, you know, sometimes people don't want a lawyer in their community. They want somebody who can come in and raise hell. Yeah, yeah, I've been there before. Right. I've been there before. So, all right, let's, you're on Cases Gone Wild, Andrew. So, Let's talk about some crazy cases. I know you've been involved in some high profile cases. What was like, let's just start like, what was the first trial that you've ever done? So the first trial, just just let me add a little backstory. As soon as I could practice law and got licensed, we were being sent to court. And sometimes we would do well and sometimes we'd get our ass kicked. And my dad's you know, only advice was welcome to the NFL, right? <laughs> that was just sort of his common saying. So, but that was a good way to learn. Yeah. My first, so when I was working for Jeffrey Figer, I remember I had like this first big motion on a high profile case and I, I was a little bit, you know, nervous. I, I didn't know anything about anything. And I said, Jeff, you know, I need some advice. You know, what should I do? Uh, you know, do you have any advice for me? And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, Marco, if you lose, don't come back, man. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. it was a little tough love. It was yeah. half half joking, I, I think. But uh, but that's the way that, that we got our sea legs in the law. Right, right. You go to court and you argue it and you develop your own strategy. And I think often I, I sort of give the same advice. You, as long as you've studied, as long as you've thought about it, as long as you know the facts and you're prepared, you know, who am I to advise a younger lawyer now what they should do? I can tell you what I might do, but you know, ultimately you're the pilot in, in, yeah. the, in the plane. And I think some people excel with that and some people fail in that right. because they just a lot implode. Of, a lot of people want to be told how it's done. They want to pull a brief and they want to cut and paste. And, you know, I tell people all the time, that's not the kind of lawyer we are. We, right. don't, we don't do that. So the first case... I believe it was a Saturday morning. We worked on Saturdays, 9 to noon, and we got the phone call <clears throat> that this individual had been charged. And This is he, in Lansing? In Lansing, and and he came in to see me, and he, and he actually was on the, the, the charge was in the paper, and he brought the newspaper article because this would have been, for the most part, before the Internet where we could have Googled it. Yeah. And he had been in a fight, and he was charged with assault with intent to do great bodily harm, less than murder. It was a 10-year. 10 years. He was facing potential 10 years in prison. Yeah, felony. And and the incident occurred during the game, just prior to the Michigan-Michigan State game, in East Lansing, in front of the statute, right at the Red Cedar River. He was there to try and scalp some tickets and go to the game. Was he like a college kid? Or? He was just a little older than college kid. He was a bigger kid, probably 6'2". And he ran into a high school kid who had some extra tickets. The kid's name was Casey Brown. And Casey and him, my client's name was Christopher, tried to negotiate a deal, and they couldn't. He didn't. My, Christopher didn't want to pay that much money, and, and Casey made some smart remark. And Christopher didn't like it and grabbed him sort of by the chest and walked him out into the middle of the street. Like where there's cars and stuff? Thousands of people, thousands of people on the sidewalks. 
and that and if you know for the game because for the game out. for the yeah. game and you know in that moment they they sort of shut down the road and you can't really get through there unless you have a pass and he takes him to the ground and the witnesses testified that he was he at some point he's slamming casey up and down against the against the asphalt and uh ultimately he laid there ambulance came took him to the hospital and and just my bad luck i guess the emergency room physician is his mother no way yes the the so wait a minute this casey guy the who is scalping tickets got uh hit on the asphalt was getting beat they rush him to the hospital and then the the injured guy's mother is the er emergency room doctor emergency d oh brown d brown is was the name and and casey had family member there family members there i think his brother christopher the proofs came in his brother christopher came running he was scalping tickets someplace else came running down took christopher and kind of beat him up afterwards so how <clears> bad <throat> was the guy injured he had um, a prior injury from wrestling, and uh, he wasn't paralyzed, but when he came into court, he was um, in a wheelchair, and eventually he recovered from the injuries. So what happened? We went to trial. It this is your first trial? First trial. Did you know what you were doing? I didn't know what I was doing. It was Frank Simone, who I think ultimately went to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, and it was in front of Judge Collette in City Hall, felony and i remember going to the pretrial, and they basically said no offers so they said we're not going to give you any negotiated no. plea deal you got to go to trial did and you have help or were you by yourself well i could have asked for help but i mean i i just didn't and i wrote i remember writing on the pretrial, you know that my offer to them was a misdemeanor and i had no witnesses they had like 20 witnesses Cause because everybody was out yes, on the and they, street. And I, the only two people I could track down were a couple sorority girls who couldn't even testify in front of a jury without laughing. I mean, it was all I had. And even when I, even when I was picking the jury and we had jurors on there who had um, been on a previous jury and I asked him what the verdict was. Judge Collette yelled and screamed at me and said, you can't ask them that. I said, I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I've had judges say that too, but I I don't know of a rule that says you can't yeah, ask yeah. what the verdict was. But, you know, you know, you, what do you know? You know, you're getting yelled at by the judge yeah. in front of the jury. So, And we, that's the thing. When you're young, like now I'm like, judge, yes, I can. Like, right, where, like, judge, right, where's the court right, rule for exa- that? Exactly. That's not true. I ask it all the time. But when it's your first time, you're just like, uh, uh, yes, right, judge. Right, you don't. Right. You don't know. And so, uh, we anyway, we we pick a jury. We try the case over five days. I put my client on the stand. Well, what was the defense? I mean, you got all these people seeing it this guy beating, it was, beating, it was, beating. It was that he didn't, He it wasn't, uh, it was a specific intent crime and in that he didn't have the intent to caused great bodily harm and there was this prior injury that the kid had i mean it wasn't much of a defense other than you know have empathy for my guy yeah did the best you could right and so we put put him on the stand and then it was friday evening and the jury goes out and they're out for hour and two hours and three and i thought man frank simone what a great job i want to be a lawyer like him he was bombastic. That was the he prosecutor. Was, yes, and he was loud, and he was, you know, pointing at my guy. I said, man, this guy is... And pretty soon, the jury has a note. And, you know, even then, first trial, I don't even know. What what does that mean, they have a note? But yeah, they come, yeah, yeah. They all come back in, and they say, we're hung. No way. And the judge reads them the instruction to go and continue to deliberate and consider... And so all, hung jury means... They can't agree because in criminal, yeah. it has to be unanimous. It has to be unanimous. Every 12. single juror has to convict. Like it's like, you know, right. every 12 angry men, right. you know, where right. one guy's a holdout. Exactly. You have one juror back there that says, I will not convict. 12, 12 or, jurors and, and they have to, you know, there's an instruction to go back and reconsider everybody else's opinion and deliberate and talk. He says, basically, you haven't been out long enough, but... If it is hung, the case is dismissed. Now it's dismissed without prejudice, 
but it's dismissed nonetheless. So, so what that means is if there's a hung jury, the prosecutor can recharge the defendant and do it all over again. Right, right? exactly. With a whole new, new jury, a whole... New trial. Yeah, new trial. So we go back, they go back out, and then uh, the prosecutor says to me, you know, what do you think? You know, do you want to do a deal? Do you want to... And I said, listen, you did a great job. Don't panic. Let's just see what the verdict's going to be. Now, I don't know where I had the <laughs> wherewithal to say that, you know. And we, we, we're sitting around, we wait, and about half an hour later, they come back with a verdict. And I'll tell you, you know, you know this experience, and I think it is probably one of the most unique experiences that anybody can ever have, is that time when the jury comes back, you see who the four person is, and they're about to read the verdict. And you know the fate of your clients is resting in the next few words, right? Yeah. And your heart is probably at about 140, yeah. right? I, it's an indescribable feeling for people who haven't been through it. But, uh, I mean, it's it's a euphoric feeling in a way. It, it can uh, be. It can be. <laughs> it's Well, yeah, it, for good or for bad. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, it's it's almost like out of body experience really i it, mean it is a it's it's you know and they and they found him not guilty of the tenure and they found him guilty of a misdemeanor wow and and, and we walked out of there and, and i remember telling him you know when we found out there was a, a verdict i said no matter what do not react because you know the judge could st still has to sentence you. Right. So uh, do you, you have know, to go back for a, a punishment right. from the judge? If, if it's a guilty. Yeah. Yes. If it's guilty, if it's not guilty, then, you know, see you later. Yes. So anyway, it was a misdemeanor and we walked out of there and I thought, you know, for my first case, I don't know how they did it, but you know, it was sort of a, a message to me or a learning lesson that somehow I felt the jury got it right. You know, no matter yeah. how bad I did or how good Frank was or, you know, all the mistakes that were made, somehow the jury figured it out. So uh, that's a hell of a first trial. Did, did Frank say anything to you? I, I, not, not, not really. Not really. But the interesting thing about it is, so I know the Browns. That would have been, that, this would have been 1993. Casey has come to my office to the guy who was hurt. The alleged up. victim. Yeah, he's come to me on, on various cases. Chris Brown, the brother, has come to me. When I see him, we always give each other a hug. D. Brown, I see around Dr. Brown. So, you know, it's an interesting... It doesn't always work like that. There's often a lot of hatred and animosity, as you know, because this is an adversarial process. But um, I've, I've become really what I consider to be good friends with that family. Yeah. And, and Andrew, that's to me, that's the highest compliment, right? So like I've had cases where like a year later, like I've sued someone. I'll give you an example right now. I sued a company for sexual harassment. Uh, we, we, we went, we did all the, all this depositions. We took it through the whole case. A year later, the guy that I sued called me and said, I have a problem. I know you represented the other side. I know you basically sued me. Right. Will you represent me? Right. Now, to me, there's no higher compliment right. in the world than to have your former adversary respect you enough and to call you because they saw what you did. Especially on that kind of case. Yeah. Especially because that can be extremely adversarial because you're making accusations that are, can be very offensive. So they Absolutely. obviously had tremendous amount of respect for you and my my dad used to say the best marketing you can have is when the jury is the is in front of that jury and and as you may know you run into jurors from time to time yeah. and i did it recently this year and i'm in line at a coffee shop and the juror turns to me and says are you andrew abood and i said yes i am and she goes i was on one of your juries and I said, what case? And I said, oh, yeah, did you sit? And she goes, yeah, I was sitting there. And she said, I just want you to know, I tell everybody if I ever need a lawyer, I'm going to call you. 
See, that's great. And, you know, I've had experiences like that, too. I ran into a jury foreman at the Lions game. You know, we're drinking beers with my buddy waiting to go in. And I hear Marco, you know. Right. And, and uh, you know, we, we talk and, and right. same similar experience. But uh, that's a, a sign because I think on the other end of the spectrum, if you're a bad lawyer, you know, you have the jury saying, man, this guy was horrible. Right. You should never <laughs> hire this guy. Right. It was It was atrocious. But even if you lose, I've had cases where they didn't go like like we had hoped, where the other side... Well, I remember one of the a trial I did, we tried the case. I was very young. I lost the case, ultimately. Uh, it was a tough case. And the defense attorney came up to me as I was packing up my stuff and said, would you ever consider come working for me? You know? So even in, in, in l- losing... You with grace, uh, you know, positive right. things can come out of it. And but you always have to protect the reputation is so important because it takes forever to build and it can be thrown away in one day, you know? People have an expectation. And you know, a lot of jurors say, Well, why didn't he ask this? Or why didn't he do this? You know. And often great lawyers um take the case beyond what you anticipate as a juror. And that's and that's probably what some of the things you've done i've we've all lost cases and i remember losing a big case the ricky holland case that we talked about okay tell us about ricky holland ricky case. holland was a case in which uh uh ricky was a, an adopted foster care child and ended up uh, the parents um reported that he went missing Eventually, about six. So it's a foster kid placed in a home. And they adopted him. Okay. And they adopted the siblings. And the parents on like a July 4th weekend report him missing. There's a massive, massive Manhunt? search for this kid child. Hunt, I guess you would it say. Lasts, it lasts months. Wasn't this on national news? National news, uh, court TV, um, on, on not every night, but at the time it was. It was a weekly scenario. And well, in Lansing, what did the parents say? How did they lose this kid? Well, they 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 said he climbed out the window initially, and and the police. How old was the kid? Seven. Okay. And the police began suspecting the parents right away, and ultimately, um, six months later, the husband Tim Holland leads the uh, police to. Uh, site in rural Ingham County where uh, he had put Ricky into a bag and thrown him into a pond after his death. Oh my God. Yeah. So why, so how did you get involved in this case? So the family hired me to represent uh, Lisa, the parents? The Lisa Holland, the, the wife, the uh, husband was represented by Frank Reynolds, another prominent criminal defense lawyer. So husband and wife each get a separate attorney. Yes. Is that normal? You know, I actually don't know the answer. Is that normal in a in a criminal case to have different attorneys for husband and wife or do they it's, have a joint it's defense? It's almost sometimes? it's almost required. Okay. It's almost required that they would have separate counsel because potentially you, they could have conflicting defenses. Now they didn't really, but ultimately Tim Holland the husband took a plea deal and to what? And pled guilty uh, to second degree murder. Well, what was the theory? I mean, what possible motive did the police say that these parents had to kill a seven year old boy? They, they, you know, motive, as you know, is not an element of the offense. It's not, but juries always. Yes. I mean, it can be a don't defense. you think it's the most the, powerful thing? Motive, like, unless you're psychotic. Most people just don't kill someone randomly, right? Or without they're, some type of reason. I, I think their theory was, and this was back in, God, this was almost 20 years ago. This, their theory was that they were just abusive, you know, that they were. Oh, that they killed the kid accidentally, like abusing? Well, like, they, they, they were overbearing and in a disciplinary act or whatever you want to say it, uh, killed them. God. So what. So what happened with the case? Did we, you... we, we, we did one of the longest preliminary exams in the history of Ingham County. And then, ever. Ever. And, then and we, so tell uh, of people who don't know, what is a preliminary exam? Because prelim- we don't have this in my, we have depositions uh, yeah. in civil, but in criminal, 
What is a preliminary exam? A preliminary exam? exam is a mini trial and in which they have to put on evidence. It's in front of a judge, not a jury, and they have to show by probable cause that the defendant should have to stand trial. So they put on like a little bit of their case just to make sure that there's enough evidence to go to a full-blown a, trial? A is judge that reviews the case to make sure that there's at least some evidence of each element of the offense that this citizen should have to stand trial on a felony. So if there's like no evidence, the judge can say no trial. Right. You, you don't have enough evidence there's, to make the, these people go through. There's not enough evidence here. And, you know, you get that sometimes. Do you? Yes. Most judges will say, well, the standard's low and the, we're not here to weigh the evidence. And although I'm not sure I would try it or, you know, the def you have some good defenses, I'm going to bind it over, you know, that's go to trial. Right. Yeah. So, OK, so why was it so long? Why was it the longest prelim in the history of Ingham County? Well, I'm sure maybe, you know, this you've done cases with uh, forensic pathologists before, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the thing about a forensic uh, pathologists as they determine the manner of death. And just so people understand, forensic pathologists, this is a do a medical doctor who does autopsies. Right. Right? Right. And then, like, if you see, what's the HBO show with Dr. Baden, who used to be, uh, like... Baden. Baden, yeah. What is yeah. that show, like... Yeah, it's some kind of... Autopsy show. Right, right, right. So they can figure out, like, was it... They test, was it poison? Right. They test where where'd the bullet enter? What there's, was the thing? There's five manners of death, right? Accident, natural, uh, homicide, homicide, um, I, and I can't think of the other two right now. Yeah. In any event, uh, so in in that particular case, because the body had been so decomposed, they where was did, the body? They found it in a bag. Yes. Yeah. The husband led them to the, uh, but they. They had a difficult, you know, and, and the thing about a manner of death is you can't determine manner without knowing the cause. Right? What do you, what does that mean? So the cause of death could be gunshot. The cause of death could be poison. The cause of death could be any number of things, right? Suffocation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And if you don't know the cause, you can't conclude manner because if you don't know whether it's a gunshot or a disease, right, you can't determine the manner of death. The classic example is Casey Anthony. In that case, you know, all evidence looked like it was a homicide, but they could never determine the cause of death because the body was so deteriorated. They couldn't, ob they couldn't determine uh, objectively, and that's how they won that case. Well, in 2006, I wasn't smart enough to, f <laughs> to figure that out, but I knew they had to prove cause, and the, one of the reasons why the case took so long at the prelims level is because they were trying to prove cause in and so did to, it, was there all kind of experts that came in there were a number of experts that came in including uh anthropologist and including uh, the obviously the um uh medical examiner and the forensic pathologist all the reports and it, it took a long time eventually it was bound over and then we tried the case in October of 2006. Well, wait, did the dad have a defense? I mean, he led the kids to his son's dead body. He pled guilty, but then pointed the finger at uh, the wife, my client. And Is that a common strategy to blame other? I mean, in the civil thing, it's all the time. I sue someone, I sue company X, and they say, yeah, well, it's somebody else's fault. He was, uh, he was an interesting interesting individual and had a lot of areas to cross-examine on. In fact, yeah. in fact, <laughs> you remember little tidbits about cases, right? Yeah. And in that case, I'll tell you a little side story. In that case, one of the big things, as you know, little facts often turn on, cases often turn on little facts, right? Details. Yeah. In that case, the night before he died, the claim was, they got Kentucky Fried Chicken. So somehow that became an important point. Well, we had all the records of the landlines, the, of the calls they made that night. And in preparing for the cross-examination of Tim Holland, I went through all the numbers that they called. Yeah. And one of the numbers was to Hungry Howie's. Not Kentucky Fried Chicken. Not Kentucky Fried Chicken. So How are you going to mix up pizza with Kentucky Fried right. Chicken? So I... I'm cross-examining Tim Holland. I get him 
to commit. We had Kentucky Fried Chicken, blah, blah, blah. And at the time, you know, this was back with flip phones. I asked my co-counsel, Mike Nichols, I said, let me see your phone. And I pulled out the record of the phone call that he had made, the landline record, and I gave him the phone. And I said, call that number. Right now, in the middle of the On the stand. On the stand. With a cell phone. Right. Did he put it on speakerphone? (laughs) Yeah, he puts it on speaker. He calls it. And it's not Hungry Howie's. And I I just froze for a minute because, you, th- you know, you're never supposed to ask a question that you don't know the answer to. It's yeah. kind of embarrassing. And I take the phone back and I look at it. And then my next question was, did you not think I was going to look at the number you dialed? Oh! You dialed the wrong number. He dialed the wrong number on he the stand? He dialed the wrong number. I said, dial the right number. To trick everybody? And he dials the right number. And Hungry Howie's answers, and the prosecutor stands up and admits, <laughs> admits that <laughs> they the whole thing about the um, Kentucky fried, fried chicken <laughs> was, was not accurate. I mean, it's a little, it's a little victory in a very tough case, uh, but a dramatic moment. But dramatic moments, which happen all the time in they the courtroom, do. especially if you're pushing the envelope and challenging things and trying to, you know, obviously in court, anytime you have an adverse witness, you want to attack their credibility. Yeah. And juries love those dramatic moments. I mean, that that's why I think, you know, the legal TV shows are so popular. I mean, look at all those, these shows, suits, you know, law and order, all that stuff. People love those little dramatic moments. And that's a great example of one. And that's a real, I mean, because they really happen. Right. And not all of trials are exciting like that. There's a lot of boring they, they stuff. Can, they can be, though. They can be. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you, you know, I've never seen you try a case. I've seen your results. But good lawyers push cases. They push them to their envelope, right? They push yeah. them. And so when you do that, right, it stresses you know, can stress the court. It can stress the other side. It can stress the witness. You know, I tell people, I tell my associates all the time, if they're not objecting to your questions, you haven't asked enough questions. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. I always say like, I get objected to during my openings, like multiple times and other lawyers are like, Oh, you get objected. I'm like, yeah, like, (laughs) and so, you know, half the objections are just because they, I'm saying things that are hurting their case really bad, so right, they're freaking right, out. Right. So they start objecting, but uh, you know there is. I think that so look to be a good trial lawyer, you're like part director because you have to like you're a part screenwriter right, right. because you have to order all the stuff and make sure it's interesting, mm-hmm. and then you're a part actor in a way because you have to get up and present that yourself. And you're a fortune you know? teller. And right? you're a fortune because teller. nobody wants to. Nobody cares how great a lawyer you are. Nobody hires me because I'm a great lawyer. They want me to win the case. Yeah. Right? They don't care that you won the last case. They, they want, want you, you to, to win, win their, their case. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So what happened? So that so this lady, what was the defense on this case? And then we'll write. That, I, I, that he did it. That he did it on his own. And there was a lot of evidence. And to, to you know, I, I'll go down believing that um, forever, that he was the one acting alone that did it. But... In high-profile cases, sometimes the train leaves the station and it becomes almost impossible to, to change people's minds. When we did the void, void deer and the jury selection, we sent out questionnaires. Our standard, you know, again, dumb, our standard for whether a jury, juror could sit on the jury is if they only said guilty one, twice on the questionnaire. If they said it three times... Then they were out. But if they only said it twice. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's not a good. That's, there was so good much. Chances. There was so much prevalence in in this case and what people felt. And even though we filed a motion for change of venue, those are very difficult. Um, and, and it was a extremely emotional case. I know jurors were crying during my closing. I know I was emotional. And and ultimately they returned a verdict of of guilty, but I sense uh, socialized with some of the jurors. I remember socializing with one who was the final holdout and he was telling me what was the turning point. And he said it was a handwritten note that my client um, was alleged to have written in the jail. And what did it say? 
it said something apologetic in relation to the case that I can remember, but ultimately um, I remember the juror saying, well, you can't win them all. Yeah. And, and I remember my response was not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you try high profile cases differently? That's an interesting point you brought up. I don't know if you saw in the news, I recently was retained to represent in a civil case, a lot of these families down in Monroe County, Michigan, where a drunk driver by the name oh, of yeah, I saw, Chittister yeah, I saw that case. drove into a little kid's birthday party. So these there was just little kids, they were having a birthday party, they were cutting cake, and all of a sudden a... SUV going like over 40 miles an hour literally drove into the birthday party and ran over these little kids yeah. and ran over people. That was a national case. National case. Yeah, yes. it was on Inside terrible. Edition. It's terrible. terrible. It's horrible. I mean, it's the most tragic thing you could think of. And so, you know, there's national scrutiny on this case. Now, there's also criminal proceedings going on against this um, this driver. I mean, it's on the news almost every day. How do you approach those types because you've done a lot of high profile cases do you have a different uh strategy or do you just stick to the you know the good playbook the f the fundamentals of trying a case are constant now you have to assume everybody else is going to be different right i think the judge generally you know you know they're going to put their makeup on get their hair done yeah they'll they'll be on time they're not necessarily going to make prosecutors are de def definitely going to handle the case differently uh, defense lawyers generally will. Um, so it's like the Super Bowl. Everybody's right, like on their you right. know top of their game. But you know it comes down to proving the elements, and then you know each element proving, you know your case, and finding leaving no stone unturned. Right. So all those things, regardless of whether it's super high profile national attention or you know in small claims, those are the things that you know, permit you to prove your case, right? Yeah. And you have to do all those things. Now, when you do all that stuff and you can be a John Marco and you can have flair and you can have charisma and you can, you know, then it's, then it's dynamic. And we've all, you know, had those moments on high profile cases where we can turn a phrase or we can, you know, grasp the moment, kind of a lightning rod. I mean, I mean, at least sometimes we're fortunate enough to be in the, those situations. Yeah. And, and, and those are great moments. Now, you know, all of our cases aren't headline cases. And, you know, sometimes the smaller cases, which may sound insignificant on the grand scale, are very important to a particular client. Have you ever had maybe a smaller case? So, you know, I've done like cases involving dogs getting shot and stuff like that by police. And you know, it's it's not it's gonna be different, but that it might be very important to the particular yeah. client. Have you ever had a case like that that Ever, went wild? We we've done we've done a lot of cases, high profile cases, you know. And people, as you know, always wanna talk to you socially. Hey, uh, you got any big cases? Yeah. Right? Do you tell me about your case? I say right? that all I was out to dinner <laughs> last night with my friend Todd Stern. What do you tell me your big cases? Uh, right, What's right, going on? Right. And so what I always say is every case that i have is big to my client you know and whether it's whether it's a high profile case like we have right now which is a hazing case at michigan state in which uh in which um one of the alleged victims died oh my during, god during a, a fraternity you know and there's seven seven defendants and seven lawyers and we're getting ready for a preliminary exam and it's it, the prosecutor recently dismissed the case or it's a case in district court where two people are fighting over a dog. Did right? you actually have a case where two people yeah, are fighting over yeah, a dog? Yeah, we had we tried a case last year. We you went to trial? We couldn't work it out. And was I, it like a divorce or it what? Was, I was I represented the plaintiff. The boyfriend had taken the dog to New York. Okay. And it was with consent, but he was supposed to bring the dog back. So they were like boyfriend, girlfriend. Right. They broke up, but then she had, she was living in a condo, couldn't have the dog. The boyfriend takes the dog back. Then he promises to bring it back. Then he well, never whose does. whose dog was it? Was it both of their dogs? Well, she originally bought it. It was in her name, but he claimed that they owned it jointly. So 
We filed the lawsuit, crazy case, crazy amount of time and effort. You can never get paid. Happened to be a family friend who asked me to do the case. And, and just so our viewers know, dogs in Michigan, right, are considered personal property. Personal property. So if you right. kill a dog, you steal a dog, whatever, you're only entitled to the amount that the dog is worth, right? Is that well, how Well, I mean, the question is, what are they worth, right? And I think that in this case, they paid like maybe 1300 at Petco. It wasn't. But, you know, the one move I made, and I actually told the prosecutor or the, the defense lawyer the night before, I said, listen, you know, we'll try this case. I wouldn't put your client on the stand, you know. Uh, <laughs> and she goes, okay, and she showed up. And the one move I made there was I called the defendant first. That's a that's an interesting, good strategy at the yeah. appropriate case. Yeah. Because it was the defendant, for, was this a jury trial? No. Okay, trial. you had a judge. Bench trial. And was the defendant really bad? He was terrible, and I caught him lying several times, and he got beat up pretty bad, and we got done with his cross-examination because he was an adverse witness, and we went out in the hallway and we negotiated a scenario where the defendant got to keep the dog, but they paid my client something like ten thousand dollars. Yeah, which was like way more. <laughs> yeah, way more, right? But it probably meant a lot to your client, right? It meant That's a lot to my client. I mean, I can't say she felt it was truly a victory, but the other hand is, even if we would have got a judgment for claim and delivery, whether we could have ever gotten the dog back by certifying the judgment in New York and trying to get the dog, could have been extremely problematic oh and extremely expensive right. and it would take a very right. long time it's hard i mean it's hard sometimes especially with those things that's a these cases take so long they cost so much money right they take so much time people don't understand yeah you know like on suits i was have you ever seen the show suits i haven't people tell me i need to watch it but. yeah well check on suits it's like it's amazing they get a new client and then the next day they're in trial on right. the case. And then by the end of the episode, the case is over. They won and they've collected all the money. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Crazy. In real life, it's like you get a new client. You're lucky to get the lawsuit in six months. Right. Then it takes two years. Then you get to trial. Then you, after trial, you have to go on appeal for years. Then you have to collect on the judgment. Like, I mean... That's, I think, because of that. And you're not getting paid. You're not getting paid. And you have to pay if you're a business owner like you or me. Right. We got to pay our staff and right. our rent and our right. electricity right. and stuff, which is, you know, I have people mad. They're like, oh, my case isn't big enough for you. I, I've had people say that. And it's like, look, it's not that I don't care. and it, But I, it, I can't take every single, I can't write every single wrong uh, I wouldn't be able to be in business. You can't. You, from can't, you can't help everybody, and that's the, f that's the first thing that when you get a new call, do you need a lawyer? Right? Yeah. Do you need a lawyer? And then the second question is, can I help you? A lot of people can't make the first threshold, right? Right. They they don't really need a lawyer. Right. You know. Right. And then the second threshold is, can I help them? And and that's a that sometimes is, you know, maybe you can help them in a different time, but maybe now is not the time, right? Or, you know, but ultimately, you know, that comes from with experience, being able to kind of give cases a differential diagnosis where you're trying to figure out, you know, you kind of eliminate everything else. And then at some point, you know, they need a lawyer, you can help them. It's the kind of work you do. Yeah. You know, you, I know uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Right. Cause that's the other thing, you know, like I send UK, I'll have like a criminal case in Lansing come in. I'm not touching that thing. You know, right. even if they meet the criteria, but I'll send them to you. You know, it's like a doctor. I go to my PCP. I'm having heart problems. He looks at my heart. He's going to say, you better go see a cardiologist to look at your heart. You know, same thing right. with lawyers, right? right? You hear these lawyers. There is no lawyer that does every single practice area well, well, I mean, it, well, you don't necessarily want that. No, you know, and and thank thank goodness we're at a time period in our in our right now where the business is better. Yeah, and you don't have to take every case, and you don't have to get spread too thin, and you can focus on one area, and you can be really good at it, 
and the industry is rewarding. Lawyers. Yeah, absolutely. And I love I love the law. Well, let's talk about have you ever had like any crazy domestic violence cases? Well, we've tried a lot of domestic violence cases, you know, and and you know, the domestic violence is uh, you know, it's it's either an assault or it's an injury or it's a death. I've tried a lot. I don't know that I've ever lost. Maybe I've lost one one case. Um, I put my clients on the stand on a number of them where they've actually essentially confessed on the stand and been found not guilty. What is that like jury nullification or I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But you know, domestic violence is there's a strong headwinds against it right now. Yeah. Um, but when jurors actually hear the facts of those cases, they're very circumspect. They're very difficult to win, you know, you're more likely to win a domestic violence case than say a drunk driving or another area of the law. Have you ever had one where somebody died? Well, of course, a homicide. Yeah, like a DV where somebody died in yeah, prison. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about it. Well, I had a, a case uh, that I tried in which um, a, a my client had been shot while at work. He was a barber. And somebody came in, and he was, you know, it was a tough neighborhood. He got shot in the head, and and the bullet lodged in his head, but he lived. He just wait. Couldn't. So your client's a barber. Some dude shoots him in the head. Yes, and, and he, he lives. And he lives, but he, where's the bullet? It's in the. It's in his behind his eye socket. He's blind. They couldn't take the bullet out. No, it was oh too God. close to the brain, and. And the guy's name was Shamari Milton. So fast forward years later, he's going out with a girl. They go back to his apartment. So you didn't represent him on this getting no, shot in the head no, thing? No, no, Okay. They go so back to his apartment, um, and he gets a call from another girl, and he tells the other girl to come and pick him up. And somehow he ambulates down to the parking lot. He's living in an apartment. The other girl... The girl that was with him at the apartment, the first girlfriend, so to speak, grabs all the knives out of the kitchen. Like a to, jealousy thing? Like yes, she's jealous that yes. this other girl's coming? Go, goes down to the parking lot. They're standing there. And he starts. She starts throwing knives at him. Like ninja style? Throwing yes, like, like steak sharp knife. steak knives steak at him? Knives. Are they hitting him? I don't think they ever hit him. So he happens to have a gun on him. He pulls out the gun. He shoots... Two times, once he hits her in the arm, and the other time he hits her in the head, and and she dies. Oh my gosh! Yes. So do you? So do you get involved in this case? Yeah. So it happens to be somebody's cousin. It's you know, always somebody's cousin. Somebody's dude. cousin. It's like Jeff and Boot. Somebody's I, cousin. I don't think we ever got paid any money. We went to ran the prelim ran the prelim and it was clearly a case of self-defense and you know i actually said in the paper if my client was white they would have never charged him you was know? was the was he african-american african-american he had been he had a prior felony so he also was charged with felon in possession of a firearm and felony felony firearm so because a felon cannot have a gun right, right. in michigan right so and that's a separate crime yeah people don't know that you get yes. charged like so even if like you're acting in self-defense, like let's say if you're a felon and somebody breaks into your house and you have a gun and you shoot the burglar, can you be charged with felony? At the at the time, yes. The Supreme Court has since come out and say, no, you know, you can always act in self-defense. Okay, okay, okay. So in any event, we run the prelim, it gets bound over. We try and get the case thrown out. It doesn't get thrown out. Sometime, this is an interesting tidbit, sometime during the course of the case, the judge, who liked me, says, you know, you're not getting paid. I'll appoint you. Oh, that's a nice solid. And I'll, I'll pay for your experts because I, I had a forensic uh, criminal, criminologist. That you were did, paying out of your own pocket? Yes, yes. Man, you're so a she, nice guy. This is your pro she bono She did a ton of, ton of work and... Um, in any event, so, okay, we try the case. We bring in the eye doctor who says he's blind. We bring in two other experts. It goes to jury. Jury finds him not guilty. Of murder. Of murder. 
But so convict, they said he acted in self-defense. Yes, but convicts him of the felon in possession. So the guy gets found innocent of the murder. They said he was acting in self-defense, but he basically shouldn't have had a gun in the first place. Right, so, right. Okay. And he gets like four or five years. Damn. And then during the course of that stay... The in bullet, jail, so he goes to prison? Yes, and the bullet moves, and he dies. What? The bullet inside his head moves, and he ends up dying. So the guy is supposed to go to prison for like four years, and then that bullet that had been in his head for all that time somehow moved and killed him? Yes, yeah, it's terrible. Oh, my terrible. God. And, and actually, the Supreme Court came out and said, even if you're a felon, if you're acting in self-defense, you can use the gun in self-defense. So he could would have gotten out of jail. Had he should have. Yeah, he should have never, never been. Put and would have. Would the prosecutor say about all this? Prosecutor said, "Well, at least I got him a life offense anyway." He said, <laughs> "Yeah." He said, "I knew I was going to get him for life." Oh yeah. man! And, and you know the interesting thing about it is we had like thirty thousand dollars in expert fees, maybe twenty thousand. And the chief judge of the court refused to pay the bill. Why? Because he said uh, the other judge, the sitting judge, said she didn't have authority to enter the order. So you had to pay for all that out of your own pocket. So, so what happened is <clears throat> I sued. The and, court? And I filed a writ of habeas corpus in the Court of Appeals. You sued the court? Yes. Yeah, and that was on front page. So that is a that is a <laughs> that ballsy a, move. Yeah. I said, look at this is an order. The chief judge actually set aside the order and appointment and the approval of the fees and costs. That's bogus. In, a, in, the, in the other case. So I sued, and eventually one of the other judges in that circuit said, we can't have you guys fighting on front page of the paper. Why don't we sit down? And we went back and forth, and eventually they agreed to pay all my fees. Did you have to see that judge again? Yeah, I was, yeah, I tried cases in front of him. How was it? You know, it was it was it was difficult that time. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that he ever held that against me. I mean, he he was cantankerous. He was the guy I tried my first case, the first case that we talked about. In oh front wow! Of. Yeah, you know, I try to get along, and I get along with ninety nine percent of judges. You know. I just do. Even if I don't always agree, I try to get along with judges. But I'll tell you, there are a few, and there's a few bad apples out there who are just nasty. And I feel like it's not as bad as it used to be. Like, I hear stories about, like, back in the day about, like, throwing lawyers in jail and stuff like that. Crazy stuff. Yeah, well, um, you, you can get along. You can be cordial. You can be courteous. But you still have to be principled. Yeah, And you still don't need to bend when people make mistakes. And judges sometimes think that because they're the judge that everything they do is right. And they may have the last word at that moment, but they don't necessarily have the last word. Right. And so, you know, you have to, I mean, they're just a judge. And, you know, I think, I don't know how you feel about chamber practice. Judges don't always have chamber practices. But when you're in chambers, you know, that's your time to speak and explain to them how they've made mistakes. And, you know, if you have to spell it out on the record with them, um, you know, you have to do that to advocate for your client. Sometimes they'll never respect you and sometimes they'll continue to run right over. Right. On you, you know, I know when I've finished, I ch subsequently tried a case in front of Judge Collette and <laughs> it didn't go well. Eventually, ultimately it got reversed on appeal the the decision but i remember getting done with the case and i was w sort of walking out of the courtroom and i said that was the worst experience i've ever had you know wow. <laughs> trying the case you cannot be afraid to to speak your mind you know even if even if it's gonna fall on deaf ears i mean i've been in front of judges where they wanted to hold me in contempt where they've said it's two hundred dollars or two days in jail and i i've said are you going to take me right now? Because I'd rather go right now than pay the $200. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you have an obligation to your client to uh, do respectfully and ethically do what's right for them, right? You know, right. I had a case when I was young and a little more fiery. I remember this judge started yelling at me. He said, he said I'm going to hold you in contempt. This was a judge in Wayne County, 
we're we're good. We're really good now. But he started, I said, Judge, I said, you do what you have to do, and I'm going to do what I have to do. But I think that this is a wrong decision, and I need to put on the record my position on this. I made my right. position. He was very upset. He said, get out of here. Uh, we cooled down. And, you know, fast forward now, we have a great deal of respect for each other. Yeah. Right. We have a great deal of respect. I think he respected me. I didn't denigrate him. I didn't um, you know, say you're an idiot or anything like that. But I, w I stood my ground and I said, you know, you do what you got to do. I'm going to do what I got to do. If you won't think that that means you sh are going to throw me in jail because I'm doing what I believe is right for my client, I'm here to go. I'll tell Take you, me away, I'll baby. I'll tell you, it's an emotional you know, just like you said, you invest so much time, so much effort. I remember I had a big civil case and commercial. It was over a bond issue, and I had filed a motion for summary, and they couldn't get an affidavit in support of the, the counter affidavit, which they needed to have in order to sustain, you know, keep the case alive. Yeah. And the defense asked for an adjournment. And I went in front of the judge and she granted an adjournment. And I was like, They're, you're allowing them to adjourn my motion instead of making a ruling on the merits? They can't defend, you have to grant my motion. They can't come, I was so- Upset. I was so mad. And then, and then we rescheduled it and then they did it again. I was, I was you know, livid. Now I don't think I was disrespectful, but I think the judge knew I was mad and we did a we did a conference call which was off the record and I know I was advocating that she didn't have the authority to do what she was doing yeah. and I since heard from other people including judges on that bench she goes they told me what did you do to make her so mad at you yeah so you know and and it was an awkward feeling and what I thought was a a big case at the time. We ended up trying the case, and it was a bench trial. I had a lot at stake. A case avowed for like nothing, you know. And and you know that feeling where everybody thinks you're out to lunch, right? Yeah. Nobody thinks, and your client needs the money. And ultimately, it was a bench trial in front of this same judge, who I thought, well, I had heard she was mad at me, and you know, completely held my client's fate and she awarded us a hundred percent of what we asked for. Yeah. And you know, so you can, you can advocate, you can be on the wrong side, but you know, you still have the law. People still are obligated to follow the law. And I've never, you know, especially when you have a jury, I, uh, you know, look at if a judge wants to be mad, fine. You know, I'm going to do this the way I think I'm going to do it. Yeah, you right. Know, it's, it is. It's just hard, especially when you're younger and less experienced and stuff. It is really hard to disagree with a judge because they hold so much power and they hold the, uh, you know, the office and um, right, right. You know, they can hard. make it's decisions hard. and you're scared. You don't want to get them upset because this might not be the only case. I had a case way up north. I'm talking like six hours up north. And I remember I'd have to drive, and this judge would make me drive up there from Detroit for like a five minute hearing yeah. that he already made the ruling tough, on. Tough. Just a mess, you know, right, right. just to show who's boss. I wanted you to hire a local counsel probably. Yeah. <laughs> and I just drove up there every single time. Right. I gripped my teeth, I bared through it. We eventually won. But I'll tell you, man, the only thing worse than going to the court and getting chewed out and, and losing a motion by a judge is getting chewed out and losing emotion and then having to think about it for seven hours uh, on your drive home. I've done it. We've all done it, you know. Uh, but I'll tell you, I always take the position, I'm, I'm there to show up to court. Yeah, I'm there to show up. I'm there to show up to court. So you, if I got to be there, I don't care. I'm coming. Exactly. I'm coming. All right, so we got, I'm to being told it's time. So let me ask you one last question. Yeah, okay. sure. And... This is a question that people ask me all the time, but and then I say, look, I don't do that much criminal law. Go ask a criminal lawyer. Criminal, de criminal defense lawyer. Criminal defense lawyer, right. Yeah, yeah criminal defense. <laughs> so have you ever had cases where you found it morally difficult to represent someone? For example, like, you know they did it, 
or, you know, it's like a horrible crime and you were like, I don't feel right about this. And how do you deal with that? No, if so, I've never had a case like that. Never, ever, never even thought twice. I'll tell you, I mean, maybe it's something about me. I went out to that site where the seven year old was in the pond and I would pinch myself and you know, there were little memorial signs there. I've seen horrific things. I did a case um, a couple of years ago where a individual was married and the w wife was accused of having an affair and he came, the husband comes home and the boyfriend is in the basement <gasps> and with a hat hatchet and chops him 27 times. Oh my gosh, the husband? The husband. And I saw the video of him at M. He worked for MSU, FCU. And so we see him less uh, about an hour before he goes home to his fate. I mean, <clears throat> do I think this is difficult to represent the person or, or individuals that are charged? I'll tell you, the tough cases are when you have um, somebody who's charged with, you know, accosting a minor. Those are, those are tough cases. But, you know, it's about the principles of the practice of law and everybody does deserves a defense and and you don't just take a case no matter what but if you can help them if you can provide them with a better life if you can get a good outcome it doesn't always mean not guilty but if you can make sure that the person is treated fairly why would you ever think that's immoral why would you ever you can give somebody good advice why would you ever think that's immoral i never I can tell you, I never represented somebody who I didn't try and make their life better. Why is that something that I should be feel guilty about, right? You, they don't always follow your advice, as you know. Oh, yeah. But you give them good advice, and you never have to be apologetic about that, you know? Whether they're drug dealers, and I've represented my share, whether they've murdered somebody, and I've had those moments in my office where... You know, people have told me the truth. And it's a rare situation <laughs> where I don't know exactly what happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know. And I tell this to people all the time. You'd never go to a doctor and tell them your ankle hurt when it's your shoulder. You want me to help you? Tell me about your shoulder. Tell me exactly what happened. And, you know, I'm as, as you get to be a good lawyer, and I've had people hire me that have told me the reason why I want you to be my lawyer is because I wasn't going to tell people what happened and you got it out of me. Well, see, that's good. Well, you're a good lawyer and that's some good advice. Andrew, thank you Thanks for, for coming having on the me. show, man. Thanks a yeah. lot. This was, this was good. And keep up all the good work for the people of Lansing and the people of the state of Michigan. Thank you. Thanks for having me, John. I'm proud of you. Thank you, man. Thank Thanks. you for coming on. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another awesome episode of Cases Gone Wild. Here with me, John Marco, and our special guest, Andrew Abood, who came in from Lansing to do the show. Please, if you or someone you know needs help or assistance or we can connect you with Andrew, please go to our website, MarcoLaw.com, or give us a call, 833-MARKO-LAW. That's 833-MARKO-LAW. And until next time, we'll see you in two weeks on another Cases Gone Wild.